Hello, my name is Emily Lewis and I'm a structures and cabin safety expert in the VTOL department in IASA. And I will present the VTOL design loads and interaction of system and structure, means of compliance, in order to meet the VTOL special condition. So after a general introduction, I will introduce the design load requirements. The design loads start with the definition of the key parameters of the structural design envelope. This is covered in VTOL 2200. These key parameters are then fed in to the design load computation, including the flight load conditions of VTOL 2215. The flight control system and its interaction with the flight envelope is also a key part of the design load determination, and this is covered under VTOL 2205, Interaction of Systems and Structures. In addition to the flight loads, the ground and water loads must also be defined, in accordance with 2220. The proposed means of compliance for the structural design envelope and flight and landing loads were already published as part of the Phase 1 public consultation in May of this year. In this presentation, I will explain these means of compliance and also discuss the changes that we made to these thanks to the comments received. The Interaction of System and Structures means of compliance will be published for public consultation in Phase 2. This means of compliance will be introduced in this presentation. The complexity of the VTOL aircraft must be taken into account in the means of compliance and the design load methodology. So firstly, we have two different safety objectives, one for category basic and one for category enhanced. The means of compliance must be adapted to be proportionate to the risk and nature associated to these two different categories. VTOL aircraft have many different configurations, flight modes, flight control setups and operations. This also must be taken into account in the means of compliance. The means of compliance has been adapted to give the flexibility to address these different configurations and flight modes and also to take into account the aircraft which have multiple configurations. So for example, an aircraft that takes off and flies as a rotorcraft and then at forward speed can transition more like an aeroplane. These different configurations are included in the flexible means of compliance, which also should cover any transition phases. The flight control system interaction with the flight envelope is also a key part of the design load methodology and adds to its complexity. The flight control system may limit the operation or flight envelope and therefore this feeds into the design load de determination. In addition, the flight load may be used to limit certain manoeuvres to avoid excessive loading on the structure. This too must be taken into account. The interaction of system and structures requirement and MOC addresses the flight control system and any failures that may lead to increased loading or changing it in the aeroelasticity characteristics of the aircraft. The design load process starts with the definition of the key parameters of the structural design envelope. The proposed MOC was already published in May this year as part of Phase 1. The 15 comments received have been reviewed and the MOC is being adapted to make it more simple and easy to understand. Many key parameters should de be defined as part of the structural design envelope. So for configurations in which the lift thrust unit can change position or inclination, these position ranges must be defined. For each lift thrust unit, an RPM range should also be defined and this should envelope the operational value. More than one range may need to be defined if you have multiple flight modes or flight configurations. The weight and CG has an important influence on the load cater's definition. Not only does the maximum and minimum design weights need to be defined, but also any intermediate weight and associated CG that could be critical for load cases. So for an example, for an Avital with consumable fuel, a design fuel weight may also be necessary as this could be more critical. The centre of gravity ranges should cover both longitudinal and lateral and conservative combinations of these. Rotational speed ratios between the lift thrust unit and any attached rotating component needs to be defined as applicable. 
The operating environment, altitude and temperature also can have an important impact on the design load case definition. The density altitude range and temperature range for design should envelope that from the operations. Design air speeds should be defined and this is the part that's going to be simplified for the next release of the MOC and will be presented over the next few slides. Another key parameter are the load factors, the maximum positive and negative design load factors. The MOC included a minimum value, however no maximum value was specified. This is because the maximum value is def very dependent on the configuration and capabilities of the aircraft. It is expected that the flight control system will limit the achievable maximum load factors and this that can then be used for your design load definition. If this is not the case, then conservative values should be suggested and proposed and agreed with the ASA. Not only should the design load factor be appropriate for the weight, you may need to define different load factors depending on your flight mode, configuration, and also dependent on other parameters, for example, airspeed. Once your conservative key parameters are defined, these then get fed into the design load computation. Again, more than one set of key parameters may need to be defined if you have multiple configurations or multiple flight loads. I will now explain the design airspeeds that were published in Phase 1 MOC. So to start with, most VTOL aircraft will be operating like a rotorcraft, at least in the hover phase. So therefore, the CS27 design airspeeds were adopted directly. This includes the design rearward speed and sideward speed, which had have a margin over the operational limitations as defined by the flight control system or the flight manual. The maximum level flight speed, VH, was also defined, and as was the maximum design speed, VD. The maximum operational speed, VNE, never exceed speed, was not defined directly in the MOC, but it was implicit as this is an operational requirement, usually covered under a different requirement in CS27. A margin must be maintained between the never exceed speed and the design speed. In order to give a velocity structure also for the configurations that can fly as an aeroplane mode, the CS23 velocities were also introduced, including the maximum maneuvering speed, VA, the maximum cruise speed, VC, and also the maximum speed for flight in turbulence or rough air, VB. Again, the two operational velocities were implicit in this structure, VNO, the maximum cruising speed or normal operating speed, and VNE, the never exceed speed. In order to determine which mode was applicable for which configuration, we proposed a criteria based on the amount of lift generated from the lift thrust units compared to that generated by the aerofoils, the non-rotating components such as a wing. We found that these two modes were not applicable to many uh, VTOL aircraft and also the criteria was not appropriate and therefore in the next phase this will be simplified. The maximum manoeuvring speed and maximum cruise speed will no longer be included in the VTOL special condition. This will allow us to merge the two modes together into a more flexible and consistent set of airspeeds, as shown on the next slide. This slide shows the simplified structure for the airspeeds. So the maximum rearward and sideward speeds are still applicable and should have a margin over the maximum operational values. VB should be selected by the applicant as appropriate to their design and this value should be then used to define the limitations for flight in turbulence or rough air. This speed and analysis is only applicable to category enhanced. For forward speed, the applicant should define an applicable VNO, normal operating or maximum cruise speed. There's no need to have a margin between VNO and VH, the maximum level speed, or VNE, the never exceed speed. This is different from the CS23 structure, and this is allowed due to the change in flight load case association with design airspeeds, which will be presented in a later slide. There must still be a margin between VD and VNE, the operational never exceed speed. 
multiple sets of this airspeed definition may be necessary to cover the different flight modes or flight configurations of a VTOL aircraft. But this flexible approach allows adaptation to different VTOL aircraft whilst maintaining consistency. The flight load condition, MOC, was also published in Phase 1 in May of this year. 19 comments have been reviewed and the MOC will be under review to simplify it and give further explanation. The intention of the MOC is to, to define a minimum set of flight conditions that must be considered in order to define design loads which will conservatively envelope those that may be seen in operations. These flight loads may be simulated or defined by combining a conservative set of parameters or a combination of these. The flight control system limitations without failures may also be taken into account when defining these manoeuvres. So the manoeuvres include symmetric flight, which is forward flight, sideward and rearward, symmetric pull-up and recovery, which should address the maximum positive load factor and extreme pitch accelerations. The symmetric pushover should reach the maximum negative load factor and also have high levels of pitch acceleration. The rolling flight should achieve two-thirds of the maximum normal load factor and high levels of roll and pitch acceleration are expected during this flight condition. Gusts should be addressed both vertically and horizontally and also a yawing condition from level flight is necessary which should achieve high yaw accelerations and also the maximum transient slide slip angle for the aircraft. A new load case has been introduced in phase two which is the vertical takeoff from sloping ground, which should consider slopes up to the limitation for the operations. One failure case is also included. The global aircraft should be able to withstand the loads from unsymmetrical failure cases due to a lift thrust unit failure. Again, to cover multiple configurations and flight loads, multiple sets of flight simulations may be necessary. This slide shows a link between the design flight cases and the design airspeeds. So again, we have our simplified structure from before and the flight loads associated to this. All critical speeds up to that one defined for the maneuver should be considered. Depending on your flight control system and configuration, you may find that a lower speed gives rise to more critical load cases than the associated condition at the maximum speed. So again, at VB for category enhanced only, the 66 foot per second gust should be analysed. This will then feed into your limitation for flight in rough air or turbulence. The yawing manoeuvre should be considered at VH, level flight speed, or VNE, whichever is lower. And the 50 foot per second gust is applicable to VH. Most of the flight conditions should be analysed up to VD which is a conservative assumption to give a margin compared to the manoeuvres which may be feasible in operation up to VNE. So that includes level flight, symmetric pull-up and push-over, rolling pull-out, the 30 foot per second gust and the lift thrust unit failure. Again, all critical speeds should be considered up to these values and not just the maximum value. The interaction of system and structures requirement addresses any system failures that may impact the loading or aeroelastic characteristics of the aircraft. The systems that must be considered include flight control systems, autopilots, stability augmentation systems, load alleviation, flutter control, or fuel energy management systems. And of course, any other system which may impact the loading or flutter characteristics should also be included in the evaluation. The interaction of system and structures means of compliance is based on CS25 Appendix K, as this is the most appropriate material we have on this topic. The CS25 Appendix K has been adapted specifically for VTOL. One of the important changes is the structure which must be evaluated under this requirement. So for CS25, any structure whose failure could prevent continued safe flight and landing must be evaluated. This is modified for VTOL, any structure, the loading of which may be modified by the failure or failures of the system should be evaluated under the requirement. 
This table shows the scenarios to, be, to consider. These include the system fully operable, which are our nominal design flight cases. For the system in the failure condition, two scenarios must be considered, one at the time of occurrence, and secondly, for the continuation of the flight. At the time of occurrence, the static strength should be evaluated, taking into account the changing loading due to the failure. The factor of safety applicable can be reduced from the typical 1.5 based on the probability of failure. The durability should also be reanalyzed to ensure the residual strength capability of the structure is able to maintain the change in loading due to the failure. Any change to vibrations should also be evaluated. If the failure leads to an increase in velocity, a flutter analysis is also necessary. For the continuation of flight, the reconfiguration and limitations on the aircraft due to the failure may be taken into account to do the static strength and residual strength evaluation. And again, the factor of safety may be modified depending on the probability of being in the failed condition. Any additional vibrations should also be addressed. For flutter, a full flutter analysis may be necessary for continuation of flight, but the flutter velocities may be lower based on the probability of being in the failed condition. And in some cases, also a fatigue and damage tolerance analysis will be necessary to demonstrate structural robustness for the continuation of flight. This MOC also addresses failure indication or detectability, and also dispatch with known failures. As explained on the previous slide, the factor of safety and flutter speeds may be modified based on the probability of failure or the probability of being in the failed condition. This slide illustrates how. So for the factor of safety, um, minimum probability 10 to the minus x should be replaced by the safety objective associated to the category and number of passengers of the aircraft. The reference for this is MOC VTOL 2510. So for example, for category enhanced, the 10 to the minus x should be equal to the 10 to the minus 9 safety objective for catastrophic. Whereas for category basic, for up to one passenger, the 10 to the minus x should be 10 to the minus 7, as consistent with the catastrophic for this class. Ground load conditions were published in phase one of May this year for public consultation. Three comments have been reviewed and the MOC is under minor review. This MOC covered VTOL landing conditions, conventional landing conditions and also taxiing cases. Additional ground cases such as towing and jacking are intended to be included in phase two MOC for public consultation. Water conditions and water landing loads from amphibious aircraft and also seaplanes will be published for public consultation in phase three. So to summarize, the design load definition for VTOL aircraft must consider the different safety objectives, different configurations and modes, and also the complex flight control system. This adds complexity to the design load methodology. Interaction of system and structures must be evaluated to ensure that all failure conditions that could have an effect on loading or flutter are taken into account. Many valuable comments have been received during the phase one means of compliance public consultation, and these have been used leading to an improvement and simplification of the means of compliance for VTOL. Further design load MOC will be published for public consultation in phases two and three. Thank you for your attention.